Radio Westeros, Episode 71, Blackwater, Part 1. Hello and welcome to another episode of Radio Westeros. I'm one of your hosts, Yoke Boy, and here with me is Lady Gwyn. Yeah, hi everyone. Thanks for tuning in. Today we have a very exciting, action-packed episode for you all, as for the first time in years, we're covering a single battle, and not just any battle, one of the key battles in the series to date, the unforgettable Battle of the Blackwater, the only battle in the War of the Five Kings in which two of the kings actually face off. Yes, and we have quite a ride in store for you. We've actually covered this battle previously as part of our War of the Five Kings series, but here our focus and approach will be both intense and immersive. In fact, this look at Blackwater will run across two episodes, with this being the first. We'll take a close look at the setup of the conflict as we consider the disparate story threads about to converge at the heart of Blackwater Bay. The circumstances behind this battle are complex to say the least, so let us unravel them all for you in a prelude recap that focuses on plot and characters. Then we'll dive into military analysis where we'll talk through everything from the battle preparations to troop numbers, timeline and logistics. Again, we're going to lay everything out for you and let you revisit this conflict with all the information necessary to add further depth to your experience and hopefully heighten your appreciation of the sequence. And after walking through the setup, we'll then set sail with Sir Davos Seaworth as he heads to war on Black Betha with his sons by his side. Relive the action with specially made readings from the battlefront designed to put you in the moment as fully as possible. And speaking of specially made readings, fans of our in-universe Westerosi adverts are in for a treat. We've inserted no fewer than six pseudo-radio ads to immerse you in this world, from characters and factions such as Stannis Baratheon, Bronn, the Antlermen, the Alchemist Guild, the Mastersmith Ironbelly, and more, so keep an ear out for them. So today, we'll cover the roots of the conflict right up to the Wildfire Inferno, and we promise it will be explosive. Buckle up and hold on tight. You're in for a bumpy ride. And Radio Estros is supported by the generosity of our patrons, so before we begin, let's take a moment to shout out our Flaming Lightbringer patron, TJ Harrington, our Dragonsteel patron, Peter, and our Pale as Milk Glass patrons, Alex, Daniel, Chris B., The Song of Ice, Seth, Kelly, Laura, Sister Winter, Moltud, Scotty, and John Wergarian, as well as B-Word and Mr. J, the Bear and the Maiden Fair, and Sir Tim of House Jib Jab Hot Dog Shop. House motto, we forge the chains we wear in life. Thanks so much to all of our patrons, and if you want to be a patron of the show, earn shoutouts, listen to episodes up to a week before public release, and gain access to our patron-exclusive content, find us at patreon.com slash radiowesteros. And so now, it's time to get started with Blackwater. I have felt from the beginning that Stannis was a greater danger than all the others combined. Yet he does nothing. Oh, Varys hears his whispers. Stannis is building ships. Stannis is hiring swords. Stannis is bringing a Shadowbinder from Ashai. What does it mean? Is any of it true? Before we dive into untangling the build-up to the battle itself, we're going to begin with a rundown of where all our major characters are and what this battle will mean to them. As we'll see, the ripples from Blackwater will be felt far outside of King's Landing, and so in this segment, in addition to the obvious characters, we'll look at a number of characters who aren't currently in the Crownlands, nor directly involved in the battle. But let's start with probably the central character in the battle narrative, Tyrion Lannister. Over the course of his arc in A Game of Thrones, we come to realise that hidden deep inside him, under a heavy cloak of anger, is a son desperate for his father's approval. Having spent his life being rejected by most of his family, with the notable exception of his brother Jaime, the moment in A Game of Thrones when Tywin tells him, You are my son, is at once validating and excruciating. 
Yeah, although Tyrion has waited his entire life to hear those words from his father, upon hearing them, he realizes that Tywin just might be coming to terms with the loss of Jaime. He thinks, You've given him up for lost, you bloody bastard. You think Jaime's good as dead, so I'm all you have left. With Ned Stark executed by Joffrey at King's Landing, and Jaime a prisoner of Stark's son and widow, Tywin naturally assumes that the Starks will deal with Jaime in kind, his expectations perhaps mirroring what he would do in their place. That they do not has nothing to do with anything Tywin does, though Jaime's eventual release will have a lot to do with promises Tyrion, as acting hand, will make to Cleos Frey regarding the return of Sansa and Arya to their family. And so, with one word, rule, Tyrion is ordered to take charge of the family interests in the capital. Tywin tells him to ignore Cersei's protests, implying that she is acting the fool, and take Joffrey in hand, as well as bring the small council to heel. He's not amused with the way things are going, and wishes to make sure that the councillors hear his message. Serve Joffrey well, or wind up as a head decorating the battlements. And for those tasks, he could only trust one of his own blood. And so Tyrion's mandate in King's Landing is as much about proving himself to his father as it is about performing a difficult task that Tywin could trust no one else to do. It says, A part of him was more pleased than he cared to admit. Another part was remembering the battle upriver and wondering if he was being sent to hold the left again, a reference to his sneaking suspicion that his father had intentionally put him in the vanguard on the dangerous left flank at the Battle of the Green Fork, a disposable pawn who could survive or not as long as he played his role. In that, he might not be too far off, but... With a fondness for survival, Tyrion is resolved to set things to rights and preserve full Lannister control of King's Landing, even in the face of some very long odds. His sister Cersei sees things as more black and white. You win or you die, as she told Ned Stark in A Game of Thrones. In her world, only Jaime and Tywin can be trusted, and increasingly, even they will fall under her suspicion and scorn. She certainly has little faith in Tyrion, and when her father fails to arrive in the city himself, the eve of the battle will find her fatalistic in the extreme. Hosting the highborn women of the city in the Queen's ballroom of Maegor's Holdfast on the morning of the battle, she observes to Sansa, Who will protect us from my guards? Loyal sellswords are rare as virgin whores. If the battle is lost, my guards will trip on those crimson cloaks in their haste to rip them off. They'll steal what they can and flee, along with the serving men, washerwomen and stable boys, all out to save their own worthless hides. Do you have any notion what happens when a city is sacked, Sansa? No, you wouldn't, would you? Cersei expects Stannis to win, and her entire family to die, which will become increasingly obvious and more uncomfortable as the day in the Queen's ballroom wears on. Seated at Cersei's side there, in a place of honor as Joffrey's betrothed, even though Peter Baelish had been sent to negotiate a new betrothal for the king with Marjorie Tyrell, Sansa Stark is one of the few people inside the Red Keep hoping for a Lannister defeat. A brief exchange with Tyrion in the castle yard on the day of the battle defines the potential outcome. This day may change all, for you as well as for House Lannister. Her hatred of Joffrey has crystallised into something very northern. To paraphrase something her father once told her mother about the north, cold and hard and without mercy. Encountering Joffrey in the yard immediately after Tyrion, she attempts to goad him into danger with some clever, if reckless, boasting about her brother, whom she knows Joffrey hates. Will you lead your knights into battle? They say my brother Rob always goes where the fighting is thickest. Though he's older than your grace, to be sure, a man grown. Unfortunately for Sansa, Cersei has no intention of letting her son get anywhere near the battle, though he will be allowed on the walls as long as his guards deem it safe. 
Sansa then visits the castle sept and prays to the seven. She joins the congregation in singing hymns, praying for her family and friends far and wide, as well as for the men who would be fighting on both sides. But when it came time for the septon to lead the assemblage and a prayer for the king, it says, Sansa got to her feet. The aisles were jammed with people. She had to shoulder through while the septon called upon the smith to lend strength to Joffrey's sword and shield, the warrior to give him courage, the father to defend him in his need. Let his sword break and his shield shatter, Sansa thought coldly as she shoved out through the doors. Let his courage fail him and every man desert him. And so, on the day of the battle, Sansa, still very much a prisoner of the Lannisters, has some amount of hope for an outcome that is positive for her. But more importantly, she hopes for defeat, humiliation and death for the person she views as her father's murderer. Speaking of Joffrey, there's no indication that he experiences anything other than glee at the prospect of the battle, being far too narcissistic and callow to conceive of his own and his family's near-certain defeat as Stannis begins his assault. Forcing Sansa to kiss his new blade, Heart Eater, he rides out of the Red Keep promising to kill Stannis himself, and then move on to Rob, laughable claims that highlight his disconnect from reality. And speaking of Stannis, this is the day where he expects everything to pay off. All the months hunkering at Dragonstone, gathering ships and begging for support from lords and knights in Westeros and beyond, he marched to Storm's End with a pathetically small army, marked by Renly as... That paltry rabble I see huddled under the castle walls. I'll call them five thousand and be generous. Codfish lords and onion knights and sellswords. Half of them are like to come over to me before the battle starts. You have fewer than four hundred horse, my scouts tell me. Free riders and boiled leather who will not stand an instant against armored lances. I do not care how seasoned a warrior you think you are, Stannis. That host of yours won't survive the first charge of my vanguard. And yet, with the assistance of Melisandre of Ashai, Stannis was able to win for himself a substantial part of Renly's army. It says, Melisandre told me that if I went to Storm's End, I would win the best part of my brother's power. But Stannis also tells Davos Seaworth of another vision, which we'll discuss in more detail later, that helped to convince him that he must not leave Renly undefeated before taking King's Landing. These visions, and the apparent success of his actions in pursuing the first, convinced him more than anything else that he would prevail over the Lannisters at King's Landing. With his army and navy both outnumbering the defenders by nearly four to one, Stannis Baratheon must have been filled with confidence and high expectations. Like his nephew, who he claims isn't really his nephew, he expects to win, and his certainty mirrors Joffrey's, as do their mutual death wishes. Back on Dragonstone, Melisandre and Selyse likely shared his confidence and prepared themselves for victory. But aboard Black Betha on the starboard wing of Stannis' fleet, Davos Seaworth was plagued by doubts. He did not approve of Stannis' choice of fleet commander, though he understood why the choice was made, and he wondered at the arrogance of their planned attack. Davos is the most loyal man amongst Stannis's followers. Watching the burning of the Seven at Dragonstone early in A Clash of Kings, he thought, everything I am, I owe to him. For Davos, victory would be only what his lord deserved, not to mention security for his family. As we'll see, the day of the battle would find him anxious and far less confident than his superiors. Perhaps his anxiety stemmed from the fact that his entire family and livelihood was on the line, with only his wife and two youngest sons safely back on Cape Wrath, and even their fates might not be assured, should Stannis lose. In the Riverlands, Tywin Lannister had not been having an easy time of it. Though victorious at the Green Fork, Robb Stark had slipped through his fingers and won triumphant victories at Whispering Wood, where many Lannister bannermen and Jaime Lannister himself were captured, and then at the Battle of the Camps, where the Siege of Riverrun was lifted and Jaime's army essentially destroyed. Cersei and the small council were behaving badly in King's Landing, with the execution of Ned Stark seeming, in Tywin's mind, certain to doom Jaime. 
Then, rather than doing what was expected of him, Rob Stark had slipped into the Westerlands and destroyed Sir Stafford Lannister's newly raised force and unleashed his northern bannermen to raid and pillage the West unhindered, answering Tywin's treatment of the Riverlands, at least for a time. Following the defeat at the Fords, as Tywin attempted to win back to the West to protect his lands, one has to wonder what was going on in the mighty Tywin Lannister's head. A quick review of his history reveals that at no point in his life was he beaten and humiliated, not once, but three times in succession, as he was by the Stark Tully army. That would be short-lived, of course, as we'll discuss in more depth in the next section, but it's easy to imagine that Tywin's state of mind immediately prior to the battle in King's Landing could be summed up in one word, angry. And that's because, with Rob Stark's ascendance threatening his objectives in the Riverlands and King's Landing in real danger from Stannis, Tywin was on a precipice. One more defeat for his team could well mean the end. Spikes heads walls, as Tyrion would say. The age of Lannister dominance of Westerosi politics could be at an end, and it would seem there might not be a lot Tywin could do to prevent it. At Riverrun, whatever news he was allowed to receive about the happenings in the Riverlands, Westerlands, and Crownlands must have seemed very grim to Jaime Lannister. Having been raised by Tywin, his expectations for his own survival would grow slimmer and slimmer as first Ned Stark was executed, then his brother's rescue plan foiled, and finally his father poised on the brink of defeat. No one knows what exactly Rob Stark planned to do with Jamie Lannister, but we can assume that Jamie wouldn't be expecting any great mercy. And speaking of Rob Stark, he stood on the other side of the same precipice Tywin was on. A victory for Stannis would mean the end of his war with the Westermen, and would free him to meet a new threat in the north, the Ironborn. But as much as Rob and his great uncle Brynden Tully may have hoped for that outcome, Catelyn Stark likely had other thoughts. There can be no doubt that she greatly desired to see House Lannister laid low, but she could not forget Stannis' words to her at Storm's End. You presume too much, Lady Stark. I am the rightful king, and your son no less a traitor than my brother here. His day will come as well. A Lannister defeat might be sweet indeed, but it would not end Rob's war in the South as much as he and the Blackfish hoped it would, and having seen the end to which Renly was brought and heard of Sir Courtney Penrose's death at Storm's End, we can be sure that Catelyn worried that Rob's turn might not come on the battlefield at all, but that his death might come slinking out of the shadows to take him when he least expected it. It was, as she would think from the relative safety of River Run, like a cold breath on the back of her neck. And what of Mace Tyrell? All he wanted, it would seem, was a crown for his daughter and greater power. Perhaps he craved a recognition he had never managed to attain, with his mother seeming to scorn his abilities and his role in Westeros' last war essentially boiling down to being a footnote as the bannerman of a defeated king bending his knee to the conqueror. First Renly and now Joffrey seemed to offer that path to him. But with much still hanging in the balance for the Lannisters, we think Mace's mindset, right up until his rendezvous with Tywin in the Riverlands, and as we'll discuss in the next section, was probably one of cautious optimism. He was ideally positioned to ally himself with the probable victor, even to help attain that victory. But his mother would never allow him to attach himself to a lost cause, and so we think it's likely that he hedged his bets a great deal more than anyone knows. Finally, Peter Baelish had strategically removed himself from King's Landing prior to the battle and positioned himself to land amongst the victors. Whatever happened, we can be sure that his 4D chess game would lead to his own advancement. It's unlikely that he had any great sense of loyalty to anyone at this point other than himself, and his interest in Sansa Stark was likely still in its nascent stages. Littlefinger is, if nothing else, wholly self-concerned 
and we can probably assume that no outcome would dismay him, as he would have contingencies upon contingencies to ensure not only his own survival, but his success. And so, with our major players and a few pawns identified and poised, for better or for worse, for the assault on King's Landing, we turn our focus to what the principal commanders were doing to prepare themselves. Keeping in mind that neither Tyrion nor Stannis know what's happening in the Riverlands with Tywin, there is tension aplenty along with expectations that are sure to be shattered. Up next, an in-depth analysis of the military preparations for the battle to come. But first, a raven has just arrived from Dragonstone with a message from Stannis Baratheon. All men know me for the true-born son of Stefan Baratheon, Lord of Storm's End by his lady wife Cassana of House Estamont. I declare upon the honour of my house that my brother Robert, our late king, left no true-born issue of his body. The boy Joffrey, the boy Tommen, and the girl Marcella being abominations born of incest, between Cersei Lannister and her brother, Sir Jaime the Kingslayer. By right of birth and blood, I do this day lay claim to the Iron Throne of the Seven Kingdoms of Westeros. Done in the light of the Lord, under the sign and seal of Stannis of House Baratheon, the first of his name, King of the Andals, the Rhoynar, and the First Men, and Lord of the Seven Kingdoms. When Julius Caesar crossed the Rubicon in 49 BC, he violated a law against provincial generals bringing their legions into the home territory and made armed conflict inevitable. It's reported that as he made the crossing, he uttered the phrase, Alia Iacta Est, the die is cast, which, along with the allusion to his river crossing, has come to mean an action that creates a point of no return. And so it was for Stannis Baratheon when he sailed from Dragonstone to Storm's End with fewer than 5,000 men to claim his ancestral home from his younger brother and declare himself his brother Robert's heir. The die was cast, there would be no turning back for King Stannis, and he was certain events would progress to the outcome he expected. That outcome had been predicted by Melisandre of Ashai. As we mentioned in the last segment, on Dragonstone, she told Lady Selyse that if Stannis sailed to Storm's End, he would win, quote, the best part of his brother's power. It probably goes without saying that Renly's death was a part of that prediction. While standing in opposition to the first vision, or so Melisandre claimed, was another vision of a time when Renly would march, quote, out of the south in his green armour to smash Stannis's host beneath the walls of King's Landing. And we'll have much more on that later in this coverage. And so, in the short term, Stannis Baratheon, having failed to secure the allegiance of most of the Lords of the Seven Kingdoms with his letter speaking truth to power, would sail for Storm's End, bring about Renly's death, as well as that of Sir Courtney Penrose, take control of his brother's seat and the majority of his liegemen, and begin his assault on King's Landing. Now that may sound simple enough, but Stannis's road was not an easy one. In this segment, we'll be untangling the background as multiple factions prepare for a showdown in the kingdom's capital. But before we dive further into that, we want to make a couple of high-level observations. First is the manner in which the Battle of the Blackwater is presented to the reader. Because of the multi-point-of-view structure of A Song of Ice and Fire, readers often suffer from divided loyalties. In this case, that is doubly so, as we soon come to realize that success for one character will likely mean disaster for another. As readers, we want Sansa to be safely reunited with her family, and Cersei to be punished, but there doesn't seem to be a clear path for that particular outcome. 
We spend so much time in Tyrion's head as he plans the defence of King's Landing that we desperately want him to succeed, but we also want our other POV on the battle, Davos Seaworth, to live. Outcomes that again might seem mutually exclusive. In general, we want whatever outcome allows the Starks to prevail in their struggles and Tywin to fail in his, and some of us want some sort of justice for Renly. In short, the reader is a conflicted mess during much of A Clash of Kings, one of several times George's favourite theme of the human heart in conflict with itself is masterfully transferred to the reader. The other point we want to make before we begin our analysis, as it will impact the course of our coverage, is that the Battle of the Blackwater is actually three battles. The Siege of King's Landing will pit Stannis against the defenses planned by Tyrion Lannister. The concurrent naval battle will support the siege, but deserves to be considered as an independent engagement pitting Stannis' new naval commander, Sir Imre Florent, against the Royal Navy, which had no commander of note, partly because Stannis himself had been master of ships for Robert and Joffrey's council had yet to replace him, and partly for reasons we'll discuss shortly. The third battle would be the one everyone in King's Landing hoped for, but no one expected, the forced march by Tywin's relief force, newly augmented by the addition of the massive Army of the Reach, leading to an ambush of Stannis' besiegers outside the city. And we'll cover each of those engagements thoroughly over the course of this analysis, with the arrival of the relief force and the aftermath being the subject of the second instalment. In this section, however, as we said, we'll be discussing the preparations made by each commander in advance of the battle. Both Stannis and Tywin's preparations take place largely off-page, though we can reconstruct most of their actions based on hindsight. However, as a major POV character, most of Tyrion's chapters early in the book deal with his preparations, and so in just a moment we'll begin by reviewing the steps he took during his time as acting Hand of the King. Citizens of King's Landing and new arrivals alike, join the City Watch to help defend our city from the pretender Stannis Baratheon. We guarantee each man a cloak of gold, a belly full of food and ale, and a bed of straw in the barracks. Specialized training with our commanders will have you ready to patrol the streets and defend the walls in no time. Apply to the captain at the main barracks of the city watch at the Red Keep. One man on the walls is worth ten beneath, and our walls are stout. We guarantee your safety and our victory with your help. Listeners of Radio Westeros, where is the bastard, Joffrey, called Baratheon, is an abomination born of the foul and treasonous incest of Cersei Lannister and her twin, the Kingslayer, and therefore no true son of King Robert of beloved memory. We do declare to all men that the one true heir to the Iron Throne is our late king's brother Stannis Baratheon, Lord of Dragonstone. And so, we call upon all leal merchants, traders, and craftsmen of King's Landing to join us in support of the one true king. With your help, we will invite him into this city, cleanse the abominations from the Red Keep, and partake in all the fruits of victory. By our sign shall you know us. We are the Antlermen. Join us! When Tyrion arrived at King's Landing on Joffrey's name day, he found a city in chaos. There was rioting in the streets, food was growing scarce, and in spite of the tax on entries that had been decreed by the Master of Coin, Peter Baelish, more refugees streamed in through the gates each day, desperate to escape the conflict in the Riverlands. Asked what the Queen Regent was doing to maintain order, the commander of her household guard, a Westerman called Vilar, tells Tyrion, 
Lord Slint has tripled the size of the city watch, and the Queen has put a thousand craftsmen to work on our defences. The stonemasons are strengthening the walls, carpenters are building scorpions and catapults by the hundreds, fletchers are making arrows, the smiths are forging blades, and the alchemist's guild has pledged ten thousand jars of wildfire. Tyrion noted that no mention is made of food, nor any plan to overcome the shortages caused by the lack of trade coming from the Reach or Riverlands. He was also more than a little unnerved by the mention of 10,000 jars of wildfire. Still, some preparations for the conflict that were sure to come were better than none, though Tyrion lost no time in turning those preparations in the direction he wished them to go. Mindful of the displeasure his father had expressed at the council being offered by the small council, he began with evaluating its members. He realised swiftly that Janos Slint was Littlefinger's creature and that Slint had been involved in the disastrous execution of Lord Eddard Stark and so Tyrion had him removed from his command of the City Watch and sent to the Wall, replacing him with Sir Jacelyn Bywater. Then he summoned the city smiths and armourers. Overriding Cersei's orders regarding arms and armour, Tyrion ordered all the forges in the city to be put to use forging steel links for a massive chain. Its purpose isn't immediately known or stated, and one of the armourers felt such work to be beneath his skill. Salorian, as he was called, protested that he was better suited to creating bespoke plate and helms and offered to be of service to Tyrion. In response, Tyrion told him, You will make chains or you will wear them. The choice is yours. So the chain was clearly of great importance to his plans, but Tyrion swiftly moved on to evaluating the remaining members of the small council. After taking the measure of Pycelle, Littlefinger and Varys, he went to the Alchemist's Guildhall to check on their progress with wildfire production. The master alchemist Helene informed him that they had produced nearly 4,000 jars of the substance to complement 4,000 that had been discovered from King Aerys' reign. Cersei's order of 10,000 jars was well within reach and so Tyrion next set Jacelyn Bywater's soldiers to training how to very carefully load the clay pots that would hold the wildfire into the city's defensive spitfires. Interestingly, a Spitfire seems to be a defensive siege weapon invented by George, but its operation and purpose seem clear. A small trebuchet that could be loaded with melon-sized pots of fiery hell in liquid form, or perhaps the less drastic burning pitch or oil, to be flung over the city walls at a besieging enemy. Up until this point, Tyrion had been preparing for an assault by Renly's enormous army marching slowly in from the west, or perhaps a maritime assault launched by Stannis from Dragonstone. But news soon reached King's Landing that Stannis had sailed south to Storm's End, where he was besieging the mighty stronghold of his birth, and that Renly was racing across country to confront him. The Baratheon brothers, rather than attacking the weakened and nearly defenseless capital city, were attacking each other. Taking the opportunity of a celebratory midnight meeting with Cersei to incapacitate her with a light poisoning, Tyrion next took it upon himself to deal personally with Rob Stark's emissary, his cousin Cleos Frey. Having delivered Rob's terms for peace, Cleos would be sent back to Riverrun with Tyrion's counter-offer. In this, he would be accompanied by a significant portion of the Lannister soldiers in the city whom Cersei had been treating as her personal guard, along with a hand-picked group whose task was to free Jaime from Riverrun's dungeon. With one stroke, he hoped he would weaken his ever-oppositional sister, keep the Starks busy with negotiating while his father prepared for battle, and ensure the return of his brother with a plot that while it's outside the scope of this analysis, was doomed to failure in any case. At this point, Tyrion expected that Sir Stafford Lannister would lead a new army out of the west to act as an anvil to Lord Tywin's hammer poised at Harrenhal. Here's a passage. 
Let Sir Cleos wear out his bony fray rump, riding to and fro with offers and counters. All the while, their cousin Sir Stafford would be training and arming the new host he'd raised at Casterly Rock. Once he was ready, he and Lord Tywin could smash the Tullys and Starks between them. Tyrion's further expectation, of course, is that Tywin would accomplish this victory over the Starks and Tullys in time to march to King's Landing to relieve the capital. This would be a reverse of his role in Robert's Rebellion, where Tywin was responsible for the brutal sack of the city with the cooperation of Grand Maester Pycelle, who in A Clash of Kings explicitly admits to convincing Ares to open the gates to Tywin, among other things, in a confrontation with Tyrion that leads to the old man's humiliation and arrest. Some weeks after Cleos departed back to Riverrun, Word reached King's Landing about Rob's victory at Oxcross, dealing a serious blow to Tyrion's hopes of a swift Lannister victory in the Riverlands and expectations of relief from his father. When, mere days later, word arrived of Renly's death at Storm's End, Tyrion realized that the clock was ticking for King's Landing. The small council was informed by Varys that while Renly's foot had remained at Bitterbridge, Much of the force that had accompanied Renly to the Stormlands had gone over to Stannis, with the notable exception of Sir Loras Tyrell and several thousand mounted knights of the Reach who were racing back to Bitterbridge. Varys also mentioned that Sir Courtney Penrose, Renly's castellan, was refusing to yield the castle to Stannis until he saw Renly's body, which apparently had disappeared. This should not be lost on the reader. The seemingly insignificant detail about Renly's body may yet play a role in the shifting loyalties of Renly's former bannermen, as we'll be discussing. More importantly, Tyrion instantly saw in Sir Loras's flight the opportunity to win the Tyrells to Joffrey's side. Correctly evaluating Mace Tyrell's ambitions, he suggested a marriage alliance with Marjorie Tyrell to marry Joffrey, securing the Queen's crown that Mace clearly covets for his daughter. Littlefinger offered himself as the emissary and, stating that in order to win the Tyrells, they must first win Sir Loras, declared that he must go to Bitterbridge. After some negotiation, it was agreed that Baelish would have a purse of gold and a written commission from the king and be accompanied by a tale of 40 knights and squires and 300 gold cloaks. As a show of goodwill, one of Paxter Redwine's twin sons would also accompany him. With Littlefinger off on his mission, which will bear fruit far beyond the scope of this analysis, Tyrion turned his attention to getting Cersei's younger children out of the city. Marcella was dispatched to Dorne with Sir Aerys Oakheart as her sworn shield to secure a marriage alliance with House Martell, and five of the best ships from the royal fleet would protect her along the journey. This seems like a curious decision, given that the fleet at King's Landing consisted of only 50 ships, and they were poised for a naval assault from Stannis, who had been gathering ships and men to man them for months. Marcella's escort consisted of 10% of their navy and the best 10% at that. In hindsight, we'll see exactly why the acting hand chose to send their best warships away from the city, but in the moment, it probably felt naive or foolhardy. Tyrion would, however, ultimately seize all the available trading vessels in the harbour, numbering 12 ships, in the lead-up to the battle. Not that they'll make an enormous difference against Stannis' fleet, which outnumbers Joffrey's by a margin of 4 to 1. Immediately following Marcella's departure, the horrific bread riots ensued in King's Landing, with Sir Preston Greenfield of the King's Guard, the Red Keep's master at arms Aaron Santagar, and the High Septon, among others, murdered by the mob. The royal party barely escaped with their lives, though royal cousin and squire Tyrek Lannister disappeared, and the depths of Tyrion's unpopularity in the city were revealed. Not long after the riots, in an odd sibling power struggle that led to more or less the same result, Cersei attempted to take Tommen's removal from the city into her own hands, plotting to have him sent to Rosby in the guise of a page to Lord Giles. Not to be outdone, Tyrion sent his own men to take charge of the prince, who was, after all, Joffrey's heir. 
Under the command of Sir Jason Bywater, Tyrion's men took command of Tommen and brought him on to Rosby, where Lord Giles and Tommen's shield, Sir Boros Blount, who surrendered the young prince with hardly a protest, were imprisoned. After making sure of Tommen's safety and putting a secret plan in place to move him to an undisclosed location in the event of Stannis's victory, the now Lord Bywater returned to King's Landing with a fresh levy of spearmen from Rosby to resume his duties with the City Watch. It was around this time that word reached Lord Varys of Courtney Penrose's death and the fall of Storm's End. And with that obstacle taken care of, the way was cleared for Stannis to begin his march up the King's Road. In the meantime, the plan to defend the city with wildfire was bearing some very dangerous fruit. Mere days before Stannis's van arrived in the Kingswood, Helion the Pyromancer reported to Tyrion that his order had been able to produce the astonishing total of 13,000 jars of wildfire. Telling the disbelieving Tyrion that the Pyromancer's spells seemed to be working better than they had since, quote, magic had begun to go out of the world when the last dragon died, Helion wondered if... There are any dragons about. While the reader knows enough to credit the wildfire production to Danny's dragons, Tyrion clearly didn't and dismissed Helline's comment out of hand. And so, while a sort of order had been restored to the city, it remained a literal powder keg as Tyrion's anxiety about the wildfire on Visenya's hill when fires broke out in Flea Bottom during the rioting proved. But work on his chain continued, and the winch towers, mentioned for the first time in Tyrion 9, were nearing completion. Another fortnight, Stannis, that's all I require, another fortnight and it will be done, thought Tyrion. And in spite of Stannis's advance, it soon becomes clear that he will have his fortnight. When word arrived that Stannis was marching, Tyrion made the decision to send his mountain clansmen across the river into the Kingswood to burn the countryside, kill Stannis' scouts and generally harass his flanks. This would prove to be an excellent use of troops that would lack the discipline to be effective during a siege and had been problematic within the city walls from the start, for all that their loyalty to Tyrion made him feel very safe. He also ordered Bronn to take a hundred men and burn all the structures on the north bank of the Blackwater Rush, between the river and the city walls, docks, warehouses, brothels, and hovels alike, to prevent Stannis using the structures for cover, or worse yet, to gain a leg up on his inevitable assault on the walls. As a strategic decision, this was very wise and would certainly pay dividends. In the short term, though, it wasn't like to make Tyrion any more popular with the small folk, though to be completely fair, evacuating the people who lived in and used those structures almost certainly saved them from being caught up in the horror of the battle to come. While we noted that the construction of the Hand's Chain had continued, the master armourer Solorian and a number of other traders, merchants and artisans from the city, known amongst themselves as the Antlermen, were discovered by Varys in a plot to arm their followers and take the Old Gate on the city's northwest side, opening it for Stannis upon his arrival. Tyrion ordered them arrested for treason. While their plot was summarily ended, their role in the upcoming hostilities wasn't over yet. Watch for them during the battle. As Stannis drew closer, Tyrion also closed the river itself to all traffic except for the royal war galleys, which now patrolled the stretch of river closest to King's Landing, exchanging arrows with Stannis's van on the south bank. The main defenders of the city would be the City Watch, a force of fewer than 6,000 men, comprised mostly of unseasoned guardsmen only recently recruited. Jacelyn Bywater warned Tyrion that he felt only about a quarter of them could be relied upon in battle. To supplement the Watch, there was a core group of around 300 knights and 800 sellswords whose services had been hired by Bronn, and the recently arrived levies from nearby Rosby and Stokeworth. Thinking back on the hundred Lannister men he had sent away with Cleos Frey and the three hundred gold cloaks and forty knights who had accompanied Littlefinger, Tyrion must have had some regrets. 
against Stannis's estimated 20,000, fewer than 7,000 men would defend the city, many of whom would be worthless in a siege, leading to Tyrion recalling his father's saying, one man on a wall was worth ten beneath it, with no small amount of hope. In spite of the imbalance of men, though, the city wasn't completely defenseless. There were the riverine defenses, three mighty trebuchets inside the river gate dubbed the whores by the city watch, the usual array of scorpions and spitfires on the walls, and a couple of other, more subtle devices. The submersion of a number of wrecks, known as block ships, between the keys which remained was designed to prevent enemy ships from landing troops under the city walls. The use of block ships in the real world has long been a common defensive tactic by cities against naval threats, often used to block or prevent access to a harbor or river mouth. In this case, the block ships would prevent the majority of landings on the riverfront, while the job of blocking the mouth of the river would seem to be reserved for the massive boom chain that Tyrion had ordered forged. Once complete, it would lie submerged at the mouth of the rush, suspended between winch towers on the north and south banks. But Tyrion's plan for the chain will turn out to be a bit more subtle than a simple barrier. And other than indiscriminately launching wildfire into battle with those spitfires we mentioned earlier, we still have yet to hear his exact plans for 13,000 jars of wildfire. But those details will wait for our analysis of the battle itself. For now, in just a moment, we'll be turning our attention to the preparations that were made by Stannis and Tywin in the weeks leading up to the battle. Lords and ladies of the Seven Kingdoms, this is a message from your friendly neighbourhood alchemist guild. In years past, we were powerful, revered by kings and queens for our ability to conjure dancing flames from green liquid. Arian Brightflame enjoyed the substance so much, he quaffed it like a craft IPA. Aegon V called upon our expertise, and we turned up the heat at Summerhall. But since the days of Ares II, it's been slim pickings for enthusiasts of the substance. Until now. For reasons unbeknownst to us, our production is increasing. Demand is high and our production line is overwhelmed. So to any would-be pyromancers listening to Radio Westeros, we require sharp minds and steady hands. Pay is minimal, but results will be explosive. Join the Alchemist Guild today and sate your burning desires. Hello listeners of Radio Westeros, it's Iron Belly here, Master Smith in King's Landing. On the word of Tyrion Lannister and of the King, I do require that all you other smiths out there drop what you are doing. Put down your Amazon metals and listen to me. To keep our city safe, we need all you metalheads from the Street of Steel to help make us links to a chain. A thousand we need. The Queen Regent may have commanded you to make chainmail and armour, swords and daggers and axes, all in great numbers. But Lord Tyrion says, don't listen to his sister, cause there's a new plan. And don't worry about Cersei crushing your hands like she promised, as that's all sorted. When I walk down the street of steel, I want to hear hammers ringing day and night. So Smiths, armourers and ironmongers, let's come together and forge the giantest chain on Planetos. And, oh yeah, don't say nothing to Stannis or we're really in the ship. Let's all link up together. And thanks. Renly's death occurred roughly three months before Stannis arrived at the Blackwater, with Sir Courtney Penrose holding out at Storm's End for nearly two months before Melisandre's shadow assassin brought the siege there to an end. 
In the interim between Renly's death and that of Sir Courtney, Loras Tyrell fled to Bitterbridge with Lords Randall Tarley and Mathis Rowan, and about a fifth of the knights who had accompanied Renly. The rest of Renly's force at Storm's End, mainly Stormlanders, bent their knees to Stannis. Since Renly died with no heirs of his body, the fact is that Stannis was, by law, indeed his rightful heir, and those lords, as devoted to Renly's cause as they may have been, transferred their allegiance to his brother with every sense of doing the right and correct thing. Lords Estamont, Errol and Caron, and Sir Guyard Morrigan, the latter two former members of Renly's Rainbow Guard, all joined with the Lords of the Narrow Sea from the Crownlands and many other Stormlanders in supporting Stannis, whose army, as we said, now numbered close to 20,000. There were also a handful of Reach Lords who stayed with Stannis. His wife's uncle, Lord Alistair Florent, and several other Florent kinsmen, Lord Varner, the two Fossaways, Sir John of the Green Apple and Sir Brian of the Red, Sir Parman Crane, also known as Parman the Purple of Renly's Rainbow Guard, and Sir Mark Mullendore, all elected to throw in with Stannis, no doubt reasoning that they might not soon be forgiven for supporting Renly over Joffrey, and might as well support a next best candidate to Renly over the Lannister claimant. Stannis also made a play to take the rest of Renly's army under his control, nearly 60,000 foot who had been left cooling their heels at Bitterbridge. Sir Aaron Florent and Sir Parman Crane, both Knights of the Reach, went to Stannis's envoys to make the attempt. In this they would be undone by Loras Tyrell and his father's knights and lords who accompanied him back to the Reach. Both Sir Aaron and Sir Parman were arrested by Loras and would spend the rest of the war as prisoners at Highgarden. The knights and men-at-arms at Bitterbridge began to fight with each other over divided loyalties, with some slipping away for home, some wanting to follow the Tyrell lead of not declaring for Renly's brother, and others wishing to support Stannis. Lord Randall Tarley would step into this chaos, capturing all the supplies and putting many men, mostly Florence, to the sword. Since his own wife was the eldest daughter of Lord Alistair Florent, the possibility that his actions were less about securing an army for his liege than they were about potentially securing the Florent lands and wealth for himself cannot be ignored. However, in spite of the struggle for the loyalty of the lords and knights of Renly's army, it would be Sir Courtney Penrose who had the greatest impact on Stannis's plans. In King's Landing, it was reported that Penrose would not yield Storm's End until he saw Renly's body. Unfortunately for Stannis, Renly's body had disappeared. Much later, Loras Tyrell would tell Jaime Lannister... I buried him with mine own hands in a place he showed me once when I was a squire at Storm's End. No one shall ever find him there to disturb his rest. Considering the implication that Courtney Penrose might have yielded had he been shown absolute proof of his lord's death, and how pivotal the weeks Stannis spent besieging him were, it's possible to point to that emotionally charged decision of Loras Tyrell to give Renly a private and personal burial as one of the deciding factors in the battle to come. There are a number of such seemingly minor moments that come together to lead to the eventual outcome of the battle, and Renly's secret burial is probably the most overlooked of the lot. Not to mention, as we alluded to earlier, it's possible that the lack of a body, of concrete proof of death, shown to Renly's men who swore their swords to Stannis, may have had an effect on those men's willingness to later believe that Renly had returned to them in the midst of the battle, and much more on that to come. Ultimately, nearly two months after Renly's death, Courtney Penrose would meet his own death under suspiciously similar circumstances, and Storm's End would surrender to Stannis. Having secured the ancestral Baratheon fortress, Stannis was at last ready to turn north. King's Landing, more than nine months after Robert's death, was finally in his sights. And so, Stannis began his march up the King's Road, with his army now numbering nearly 20,000 mounted knights, light horse, and free riders, while his navy of 200 ships, nearly four times the size of Joffrey's, carrying most of the 4,000 or so men who had accompanied Stannis from Dragonstone, made its way up the coast. 
Unbeknownst to Stannis, due to numerous factors beyond his control, the timing of his attack would be what truly made the outcome hang in the balance. In spite of his superior numbers, the delay at Storm's End would prove to be very costly indeed. And speaking of superior numbers, Stannis's vanguard alone, led by Sir Guyard Morrigan, formerly Guyard the Green of Renly's Rainbow Guard, numbered 5,000 men, nearly equal to the size of the city watch within King's Landing's walls. Stannis himself would lead the rest of the army from the rear, staying with his reserve while the battle played out before him. In this he would prove lucky, his brother Robert, a much more bold leader who favoured a more forward position, likely wouldn't have survived the battle to come. But that's getting ahead of ourselves. His navy was under the command of Sir Imre Florent, Lady Selyse's brother, who sailed on Stannis' own flagship Fury, a triple-deck war galley powered by 300 oars with, quote, a deck given over wholly to scorpions and topside mounted catapults fore and aft, large enough to fling barrels of burning pitch. Sir Imry was chosen over more experienced sailors due to his family connection with Stannis, and his plan of battle would turn out to be needlessly arrogant. However, their far superior naval power was not insignificant, and as such, perhaps deserves an explanation. Stannis had been Robert's master of ships and Lord Admiral, commanding fury during the Baratheon assault on Dragonstone that marked the official end of Robert's rebellion and during his encounter with Victorian Greyjoy during the Greyjoy Rebellion a few years later. After the death of John Arryn, when Stannis retreated to Dragonstone even as Robert rode north to name Ned Stark his hand, Stannis took his flagship and, by most accounts, a little more than half of the royal fleet whose captains were loyal to him. Once at Dragonstone, he took to building ships as well as hiring them. By the time he sailed for Storm's End, this fleet had grown to number more than 60 great war galleys, including Fury, as well as an even greater number of lesser ships, cogs and carracks that may have been seized trading vessels, about 40 mirish sail sails, and two dozen or so ships belonging to the Lycene pirate lord Salador San. Besides his years as master of ships, earning him the loyalty of many captains, we should not forget that Stannis had been made Lord of Dragonstone by his brother, giving him virtual control of Blackwater Bay and most of the seafaring houses of the region. His victory at Storm's End may have brought him even more strength at sea, as virtually all the Storm Lords pledged to his cause. In short, Stannis's naval superiority in the East was ensured when his brother Robert placed him in a position to gather such strength. Unfortunately, this superior navy would be beset by bad weather in Shipbreaker Bay and the Straits of Tarth, and Stannis would outpace his ships by more than a week, arriving in the Kingswood only to have to deal with the Vale clansmen Tyrion had sent to harry his flanks while waiting for his navy carrying his siege engines and his hopes of victory to bring up the rear. Additionally, for all that Melisandre had been instrumental in his victory at Storm's End, Stannis had sent her back to Dragonstone, lest she be given credit for what he expected would be his victory at King's Landing. Would her presence have made a difference? It's hard to say since her flame reading is rather notoriously bad, or rather her interpretation is poor. As the upcoming battle will prove, Melisandre often saw the future quite accurately, but failed on many occasions to interpret it correctly. And speaking of failures, when Stannis arrived on the south bank of the Blackwater Rush ahead of his navy, he busied his men preparing themselves for battle. Rafts were built and arrows fletched, all while the new winch tower sitting at the mouth of the river was ignored. It's likely Stannis didn't feel the exposed risk of attacking a tower was worth it, since there was no sign of a boom chain being raised to prevent his ships accessing the river. Furthermore, such a chain hadn't existed a mere matter of months earlier when Stannis had last been in King's Landing. Perhaps he failed to credit the idea that it could have been built and deployed in such a relatively short time. 
his supporters in the city, notably among them the Master Armour Solorian, had certainly failed to alert him of the priority the acting hand had placed upon its construction. In any case, Stannis' failure to destroy the new tower, which Davos was immediately aware of as the ships approached the mouth of the river, would prove to be an enormous tactical error, one of several things that can be singled out as decisive to the outcome of the day. Finally, and speaking of Solorian and the Antlermen, we cannot ignore Stannis' apparent lack of intelligence operatives. Perhaps due to his previously heavy reliance on Melisandre and her visions, he doesn't seem to have had any sources outright spying for him in King's Landing, the support of the Antlermen notwithstanding. But with Melisandre back on Dragonstone and her visions, as we noted, generally being notoriously tricky to interpret, it's impossible to say if her presence might have moved the needle in Stannis's favor. Might she have had a vision of the battle to come to counteract her previous vision where, quote, Renly rode out of the south in his green armor to smash Stannis's host beneath the walls of King's Landing? In any case, three months after Renly's death, Stannis and his army, outnumbering the defenders by nearly four to one on land and at sea, arrived at King's Landing it would be up to Imri Florent and Guyard Morrigan to begin the assault, as we'll cover in the next segment. But first, we want to catch up with what had been going on with Tywin Lannister in the Riverlands, right after these words from the captain of the Hand's Guard. Hello listeners of Radio Westeros, Bronn, commander of the Hand's Guard here, just carrying out some orders. If you're living between the walls of King's Landing and the river, I'm going to need you to move. Beggars, paupers, fishwives, find somewhere else to live, or me and my men will throw you out on your asses. And you don't want that. To keep us safe from Stannis, we need to burn every hovel, bait shack, pot shop and alehouse down to the ground. It has to go, every bit of it, or else Stannis will be up those ladders and before you know it, he'll be grinding his bloody teeth in the Red Keep. Should you refuse to get out the fucking way, you may find yourself swimming in a bowl of brown, served up in flea bottom, all cut to pieces and boiled. So, word of advice, shift your asses before me and my hundred men shift them for you, on the orders of your Hand of the King, the Lord Demon Monkey. I'm gonna clear that waterfront and save this damn city if it's the last fucking thing I do. And who knows, they might even make me a knight. Within days of Renly's death at Storm's End, Rob Stark would win a great victory at Oxcross in the West. When the news of those two events became known, forces were put in motion that would have a decisive impact on the eventual battle at the Blackwater. Renly's death caused Tyrion, with the approval of Joffrey's small council, to send Peter Baelish to Bitterbridge to seek out Loras Tyrell and a new alliance between the Tyrells and the Lannisters. In the Riverlands, news of Oxcross would draw Tywin out of his position at Harrenhal as he hurried west to where the Stark Tully army continued to harry the region with impunity, having basically eliminated Sir Stafford Lannister's army, and with it, any resistance to be found among the Westermen, the vast majority of whom remained with their liege in the Riverlands. In order to understand what happened next, it's very helpful to unwind the sequence of events as they occurred in various parts of Westeros. Catelyn Stark arrived at Bitterbridge on the day news arrived that Stannis was besieging Storm's End. Back at Riverrun, Rob Stark had set out westwards with his army, leaving the River Road and heading in the direction of the Golden Tooth. It was here that Stafford Lannister had begun assembling and training a new army to replace the men lost at Whispering Wood and the Battle of the Camps earlier in the year. Using the element of surprise, Rob's army swiftly claimed a victory resulting in Sir Stafford's death and the survivors' retreat to Lannisport. 
With no army to withstand them, the Northmen commenced raiding the surrounding area, seizing cattle, gold mines, and whatever supplies they could carry away, according to Martin Rivers, quote, paying the Lannisters back in kind for the devastation they'd inflicted on the Riverlands. It was this news that brought Tywin out of Harrenhal, finally marching west to deal with Robb Stark, who had acted in an entirely unexpected way. However, because Renly died nearly a week after Oxcross, it's likely that Tywin did not hear about the situation at Storm's End until much later. The fastest route into the west was to cross the hills via the pass at the Golden Tooth, and so Tywin would march cross-country with the intention of fording the Red Fork to reach the River Road and the pass. And this is where we encounter another of those decisive moments where a seemingly small decision has a huge follow-on effect upon the Greater War. Rob Stark had left his uncle Edmure at Riverrun with the simple order to hold the castle. However, when Edmure learned of Tywin's march, he called his banners, swiftly assembling a force of about 8,000 foot and 3,000 horse, about half the size of the force commanded by Lord Tywin, Edmure caused every fordable area of the Red Fork to be defended, using the higher ground on the west bank, as well as a variety of weapons such as spikes, caltrops, and scorpions, to his advantage. When Tywin approached, he was repulsed in several areas at once, an effort that lasted several days and cost Tywin heavy casualties, including the loss of several of his commanders. Unable to make the crossing, Tywin turned back and was last seen by Edmure headed southeast, likely making for the Gold Road, the next closest access to the west. Unfortunately, as Brynden Tully would later tell his nephew Edmure, the delay at the fords allowed riders out of Bitterbridge to reach him with word of what was happening to the east. This word will, of course, have been about the deaths of Renly and Courtney Penrose, and Stannis' subsequent victory at Storm's End, news of which had reached Riverrun just as Edmure set out to defend the fords. At Riverrun, weeks later, the Blackfish continued his explanation of Tywin's actions after the Battle of the Fords. Lord Tywin turned his host at once, joined up with Mathis Rowan and Randall Tarley near the headwaters of the Blackwater, and made a forced march to Tumblr's Falls, where he found Mace Tyrell and two of his sons waiting with a huge host and a fleet of barges. They floated down the river, disembarked half a day's ride from the city, and took Stannis in the rear. The best timeline estimate we have is that Penrose's death took place about two weeks prior to Tywin's defeat at the Red Fork. All those days Stannis lost negotiating with Courtney Penrose, and then waiting for his navy, delayed by bad weather, are coming into very sharp focus here. But Tywin wasn't acting in a vacuum, and so we should turn our attention back to the army of the Reach. When the news of Oxcross reached King's Landing, as we said, it seriously deflated Tyrion's hopes that his father would win a swift victory in the Riverlands and rush to the capital's aid. And so, when they learned of Renly's death at Storm's End, he and the rest of the small council were ready to seize their opportunity to make an alliance with someone whose army was much closer, already fully mobilized, and currently without an objective. Thus, Littlefinger was sent to Bitterbridge to win over Loras Tyrell, departing mere days after Loras himself set out from Storm's End. And given the difference in their journeys, Baelish was traveling a shorter distance on the Rose Road while Loras was racing across country, they likely arrived within days of each other. We don't know exactly what happened next, but we can speculate. That Loras and Baelish continued on to Highgarden is certain. We know Loras brought Parman Crane and Erin Florent, the envoys Stannis sent to Bitterbridge, back to Highgarden as prisoners, where they seem to have remained. And we also know that Peter Baelish went there, as he describes his meetings with Mace and Lady Olenna, and hints at the plot he managed to devise with Lady Olenna's cooperation to Sansa in A Storm of Swords. Mathis Rowan and Randall Tarley, on the other hand, remained at Bitterbridge to take command of the troops and stores there, killing or scattering any who declined to join them. It seems likely that they were then charged with making contact with Tywin while the terms of the alliance were hammered out at Highgarden. 
Tywin would likely have left Harrenhal at this point, and so scouts, or possibly even a raven from Harrenhal, may have brought news of his westward march. Rowan and Tarly were most likely making for the gold road due north of Bitterbridge with the intent of connecting with Tywin along his march. We think it's highly unlikely that they would have known of his plans to cross the hills until scouts brought back word of his assaults on the fords. And since we know Tywin headed southeast after his defeat at the Fords, we feel pretty sure that by that time, one of the Tarly or Rowan scouts will have brought him news of a massive army waiting for him in that general direction. Heading southeast, Tywin connected with Lords Rowan and Tarly and the bulk of the Reach army near the headwaters of the Blackwater, somewhere in the vicinity of Stony Sept. From there, it was a short march south to Tumblers Falls. In the meantime, Mace Tyrell, with a smaller and more nimble force that included his sons Loras and Garlan, as well as Peter Baelish and his escort, had made for Tumblers Falls, a town situated to the south of Stony Sept, presumably, as the name indicates, near a waterfall at the confluence of several tributaries. Arriving at the rendezvous ahead of Tywin, it seems that Mace used the time to assemble a fleet of barges to transport the men and their horses by river to King's Landing. Because the Blackwater is noted to be a very swiftly flowing river, this would enable the combined army, now numbering in the area of 60 to 80,000 men, to travel with speed with the added benefit of giving them access to both banks of the river upon their arrival at the capital. This is very important since they have no way of knowing which side of the river they would find Stannis upon, and in the event the answer is both sides, it would give them the ability to divide their attack. Keep an eye on this detail in the battle analysis. It is worth noting that Tumblers Falls is a significant distance well into the Riverlands for Mace to travel from Highgarden simply for the purpose of commandeering some barges and meeting up with Tywin. That the Reach would work quickly to secure their position on a winning team is no surprise. And with Littlefinger working to secure the Alliance, a rendezvous is also hardly a surprise. What is perhaps a surprise is to find Mace himself so far north, well inside the borders of the Riverlands, since the rendezvous could have easily been accomplished by Lords Rowan and Tarly without him. That didn't happen by accident, and given Mace Tyrell's obvious opportunism and the uncertainty of Tywin Lannister's position even up until a matter of days before he merged his army with Tyrell's, Coupled with the fact that Rob Stark appeared to be winning, we've wondered if Mace may have been playing his own wait-and-see game in the Southern Riverlands. Obviously, by the time the rendezvous occurred, it was clear what the next step would be. But it's interesting to wonder what Mace's course of action would have been if Tywin had, for example, defeated Edmure Tully and achieved the crossing at the Red Fork. Though victorious in that moment, that's one event that could have clearly led to a Lannister defeat at King's Landing, with Rob's army cutting off any movement back east by the Westermen by positioning themselves athwart the Gold Road, and with Tyrion and Cersei left to deal with Stannis at King's Landing alone. Would Mace have rushed to aid Tywin, or gone to King's Landing? Would he have split his army and boldly attempted to do both? Or would he have waited on the outcome and allied himself with the eventual victor. Mace's presence in the Riverlands, and perhaps Littlefinger's curious silence to Tyrion and Cersei for many weeks after he departed the capital, may hint at just such a wait-and-see strategy. Certainly Mace wanted a crown for his daughter, and the Lannisters seemed like the best way to achieve that after Renly's death, but neither Mace nor Littlefinger had any real devotion to House Lannister, and both have proven themselves to be fairly opportunistic. This is just one of many moments where, had things gone slightly differently in one theatre, a dramatically different outcome may have occurred in another. 
In any case, as it happened, Mace undoubtedly marched into the Riverlands in order to link up with Tywin, and, having accomplished that, the now massive relief army floated down the Blackwater to disembark half a day's ride from King's Landing on the morning of the battle. Some three months after Renly's death and the battle at Oxcross, the stage at King's Landing had been set and all the players were in their places, awaiting their cues. Unbeknownst to Tyrion, relief is just hours away, while unbeknownst to Stannis, his defeat lurks upstream from where his army is crossing the river, even as his massive naval force rushes in from the bay. All that remained was for a spark to set things in motion. But before we move on, it's time to recognize our supporters from the Valyrian Steel level. Thanks to Aerodo, Aileen, Akiva of House Hunt, Aka from Ashai, Oxheart, Amber the Adamant, Anna, Hortense of Ashai, Blight Spirit, Cabeth the Unfrozen, Marge of the Mage, David, Dean, Drew, James K., Lord Sosa and his faithful canine companion Theoden, Jill, Miss Jody, J.M., Herbert Westeros, the Miskatonic Maester, Epimetheus, Juna of House Aiko, Casey, Lady Silverwing, Infendaris, the Unspeakable Terror, Luke, Mark, Boss, Noble Sir Matthew, Sword of the Early Moon, the Sithorian, Sally, Sheila, Tristis Lorene, Wild Child of the Wolfswood, W, Sword of the Evening, and Lady Diarliz of Castle Naki, the Alpha Patron. Blackwater Bay was rough and choppy, white caps everywhere. Black Betha rode the flood tide, her sail cracking and snapping at each shift of wind. Wraith and Lady Maria sailed beside her, no more than twenty yards between their hulls. Across the sea, war horns boomed deep, throaty moans like the calls of monstrous serpents, repeated ship to ship. In Davos Three of A Clash of Kings, we're with the Onion Knight as he sails Black Betha towards King's Landing, preparing for the all-out assault on the capital. With George describing such a large host of ships, and with all manner of nautical verbiage being employed, it's sometimes difficult for the reader to get their bearings, and so we'll attempt to break down the action and orient you. We'll also evaluate the key decisions characters make that will go on to impact Stannis' quest for glory. The first major decision to think about is Stannis' choice for Admiral. As we mentioned, in the run-up to the invasion, Stannis selected his brother-in-law, Sir Imri Florent, as the leader of the fleet, given Stannis himself would be marching with his army up the King's Road to the south bank of the Blackwater Rush. However, Imri was not an experienced naval man, and while the move to promote him to the position of Lord High Captain can be attributed in part to nepotism, it was also undeniably owing to Stannis' fear that, should he make an unpopular choice, his high lords would desert him. Given that many, including Imri, had first taken Renly's side, Stannis was in a precarious position, trying to hold together his campaign on a political level. He must have been acutely aware that it would only take a handful of defectors to unravel his whole campaign, a sentiment which surely influenced this most critical of decisions. As such, Stannis chose Imri to lead the fleet into war over two other plausible and capable contenders, Stannis himself and the lowly smuggler turned knight Davos Seaworth. As we mentioned briefly earlier, during the Greyjoy Rebellion some 16 years ago, Stannis had proved himself as a sea captain when he attempted to best the Greyjoys at their own game. The Battle of Fair Isle was pivotal to the defeat of the Greyjoy navy and saw Stannis lead the royal fleet to victory by trapping Victorian's iron fleet from two directions and smashing them in the straits. Given he had gone on to serve the realm as master of ships for many years, the decision to entrust his prized fleet to someone with not a fraction of the same experience was certainly a risk, in spite of the fact that he clearly also needed someone to lead the soldiers marching up from Storm's End. 
However, one man with plenty of experience at sea, especially around the shores of King's Landing, is Davos Seaworth. Davos had been a smuggler for many years before Stannis raised him up and shortened his fingers, and he knew every nook and cranny along the shoreline. But as we mentioned, politics was a key factor in Stannis' decision to promote Sir Imri, and with classism rife amongst Stannis' high lords, elevating a man of the lower class like Davos to such a high position would have offended the men Stannis needed to facilitate his invasion. As such, Stannis was in a bind, and perhaps hoped his sheer numerical advantage over Joffrey at sea would negate the lack of experience on the part of his admiral. Imri's tactics are especially interesting because as readers we get to experience them through Davos's critical eyes and we'll see how keenly Davos picks up on the Admiral's errors. With the advantage of ship numbers at around a 4 to 1 ratio, it seems Imri's plan is to strike unapologetically in force and simply overwhelm the opposition. He divides the fleet of 200 ships into 10 distinct battle lines, each line 20 ships across. Davos is on the wing of the starboard side, so King's Landing is to the right-hand side through his eyes, and he's close enough to the coast to be able to see along the shoreline. The ships in Davos's line will be a mere 20 yards from one another when they form the lines, so they're packed in tightly, and will be even more so when they approach the mouth of the bay. And Davos takes pride in the fact that his two sons are either side of him, holding the line perfectly. His eldest son, Dale, is in command of Wraith to his left, and to the right is Lady Maria, named for Davos' wife, captained by his second son, Allard. His third son, Mathos, is second man on Davos' own Black Betha, while his fourth son, Merrick, is the oarsmaster of Fury under the command of Imri Florent, the same flagship Stannis commanded at Fair Isle. His fifth son, Davin, is marching up the King's Road, squiring for Stannis. The fact that five of Davos' seven sons are on their way to engage in a dangerous battle must have been a difficult realization for him, especially given the fact that three of the four at sea, as well as himself, are in a notably dangerous position in the formation, with the starboard wing likely to take heavy fire from the city's projectile defenses. It says, Davos and his sons had been assigned a place in the second line of battle, well out on the dangerous starboard wing. A place of honor, Allard had declared, well satisfied with the chance to prove his valor. A place of peril, his father had pointed out. So with six Seaworth lives on the line and fighting for his king, Davos could not be more invested in the outcome of this war. Maya Seaworth might never see some of her sons again, or her husband, and there's no question that Davos would have considered the possibility that his wife could be left to raise young Stannis and Stefan as a widow. The stakes couldn't be much higher, and that dynamic feeds into the nervous excitement George wants us to feel as we ride the flood tide over the whitecaps and choppy waters with a one-way ticket to war. Back in King's Landing, the mood is similar. The nervous anxiety of waiting is giving way to the feverish frenzy of last-minute preparations as men arm themselves in the barracks and gatehouses and in the castle yard. Horses are prepared for sorties and counter-siege weapons, catapults, scorpions, and spitfires, and placed upon the walls. The sounds of these preparations set a very particular mood, backed by the fervent singing of the faithful in the city's sept, as described in Sansa 5. They had been singing in the sept all morning, since the first report of enemy sails had reached the castle. The sound of their voices mingled with the wicker of horses, the clank of steel, and the groaning hinges of the great bronze gates to make a strange and fearful music. And so Sir Imri's formation lurches ever closer to King's Landing, with three lines of galleys at the front, including five of our six Seaworths, followed by lines of smaller Mirish vessels ready to deploy troops along the shorelines, with a contingent of odds and sods, quote, sail ships, carracks and lumbering great cogs behind. Bringing up the rear is Salador San, the Lysini pirate, quote, in his proud Valyrian, paced by the rest of his galleys with their distinctive striped hulls. 
Imagine the majesty and terror of the scene as this armada crashes over waves and swells, edging ever closer to the capital, the late afternoon sun glimmering off the surface of the water, every man knowing this day could be their last. On the final leg of their journey up from Storm's End, they've turned past Sharp Point and are now on a southwestern course through Blackwater Bay. Davos observes the scene around him early on in the chapter. Across the sea, war horns boomed, deep throaty moans like the calls of monstrous serpents repeated ship to ship. Bring down the sail, Davos commanded. Lower mast, oarsmen to your oars. His son Mathos relayed the commands. The deck of Black Betha churned as crewmen ran to their tasks, pushing through the soldiers who always seemed to be in the way, no matter where they stood. Davos watches Fury to the southeast, taking down her sails as she leads the way, her deck packed so tightly with scorpions and soldiers that it had lost some of its swiftness. Imri sounds the war horns and sends commands through the lines as the drums of war begin to pound their slow rhythm so deeply that it makes Davos's phantom fingers tingle. Imagine the fear, the adrenaline, Davos's heart beating to the sound of the drums. As the sails are pulled down to reduce exposure to fiery projectiles and the oarsmen begin to pull the galleys with every beat, Davos orders a slow cruise and observes Lord Monfred Valerian's silver-hulled Pride of Driftmark coming to the port side of Wraith. He makes further mental notes about the positioning of the ships around him, and we see the warship Swordfish, owned by House Bar Emin of Sharp Point, struggling to keep formation. Keep an eye on this one, as Davos's instincts immediately tell him that in spite of 200 oars and a large ram, her unnamed captain gives him serious doubts about the ship's usefulness. The last thing this fleet needs is a ship becoming a liability. Davos notices the confidence with which the men on the front lines are shouting to one another. None have much experience in war, but show the same self-belief as their Admiral Sir Imri. Yet confidence is a strange thing. Too little of it and one can succumb to paralysing fear. Yet too much of it and one can give way to arrogance, blinding oneself to clear dangers. As Davos contemplates the hubris of his fellows, he reflects on his own fears and doubts, and how, in spite of his own lack of battle experience, owing to his background as a simple smuggler, he would have done things very differently. George is bringing the contrast between Sir Imri and Sir Davos into sharp focus, and the comparisons continue throughout the chapter. There's a sort of green highborn mindset versus wise, well-worn man dynamic going on, not too dissimilar to the Weimar Royce versus Gared dynamic of the first prologue. Davos's first point of contention is with Imri's rather bizarre decision not to scout downriver before arriving with the main fleet. The Onion Knight, had he been in charge, would have chosen a selection of his swiftest ships to probe and test and see what lay ahead. It says... When he had suggested as much to Sir Imry, the Lord High Captain had thanked him courteously, but his eyes were not as polite. Who is this low-born craven, those eyes asked. Is he the one who bought his knighthood with an onion? And so we see how petty classism is affecting Stannis's campaign. Imry's ignorant attitude towards Davos is blinding him to some excellent advice from an experienced seaman. Given Stannis was the one who raised the low-born smuggler to the position he's in, Imri's not even acting in Stannis' spirit, and so causing this unnecessary inefficiency is ultimately a real kick in the teeth for Stannis, who will later say, Curse that fool of Florent who sailed my fleet into the jaws of a trap. And perhaps the same snobbery was behind the decision to keep Salador San's fleet as the rear guard, when they might be better suited to attack. Imri might not trust the Lysini, yet Davos shares no similar concerns. He thinks plainly, Salador's son was a resourceful old pirate, and his crews were born seamen, fearless in a fight. They were wasted in the rear. So these are two major decisions. Both will become more questionable as the battle unfolds, and both are expressly linked to Imri Florence's small-mindedness. How frustrating it must be for Davos to be able to read the game like this and to have so much on the line 
and still not have a voice due to his background. And Imri's plan is to lay everything out in the open. In his mind, he has clear superiority at sea and so doesn't need to hide his strength. There's no amount of subtlety or caution or subterfuge. The first two lines of war galleys will meet any of Joffrey's little fleet head-on and destroy them, and Imri even gives them the nickname The Boy's Toys, which of course, to Davos' mind, smacks of the aforementioned arrogance. While those front lines engage and clear the way, the lines behind will take advantage of being shielded and quote, land companies of archers and spearmen beneath the city walls, and only then join the fight on the river. The smaller, slower ships to the rear would ferry over the main part of Stannis' host from the south bank, protected by Salador San and his Lysini, who would stand out in the bay in case the Lannisters had other ships hidden up along the coast, poised to sweep down on their rear. Davos acknowledges that this swift and simple plan does at least make some sense, given harsh winds had disrupted the fleet during the journey from Storm's End. It says, They had lost two cogs on the rocks of Shipbreaker Bay on the very day they set sail, a poor way to begin. One of the Mirish galleys had foundered in the Straits of Tarth, and a storm had overtaken them as they were entering the gullet, scattering the fleet across half the narrow sea. All but twelve ships had finally regrouped behind the sheltering spine of Massey's Hook in the calmer waters of Blackwater Bay, but not before they had lost considerable time. And of course, time is of the essence given that Stannis has been leading his men, who are largely on horseback from Storm's End, along an arrow straight section of the King's Road to the Blackwater Rush. In Davos's estimation, Stannis would have arrived there days ago, and leaving him in the vicinity of King's Landing waiting for war is a poor idea for reasons of safety, weariness and food supplies there's no chance of Stannis being able to initiate his attack without his fleet, as the fleet was carrying his siege engines, not to mention that a mounted army alone would not fare well against the walls of the city that lie behind what is surely one of the widest rivers in Westeros. The thought of Stannis tearing out what little hair remains to him must have been quite terrifying for Imri, and certainly we can understand what sort of pressure he was under. With all that said, however, it's clear that mature and battle-seasoned Stannis would not want to take unnecessary risks for the sake of a few hours. Nervous, afraid, arrogant, belligerent, or perhaps a mix of all, Sir Imri Florent proceeded without the due caution Davos, and we think Stannis, would have employed. And the result would have been more intelligence, something we've highlighted was sorely lacking within Stannis's faction. Davos recalls that their fleet had caught and boarded half a dozen fishing skiffs off Merling Rock, a fishing spot presumably around the fringes of Blackwater Bay, while Emery was full of self-satisfied boasts that, quote, a small spoon of victory is just the thing to settle the stomach before battle, Davos saw the opportunity to find out what the men knew. Hailing from the city and remembering that sailors and fishermen seem to be privy to the latest gossip in this series, the captives informed Davos that acting hand Tyrion Lannister had been forging a giant boom chain from the iron in the city. Tyrion had told Master Smith Ironbelly that, I want every forge in King's Landing turned to making these links and joining them. All other work is to be put aside. I want every man who knows the art of working metal set to this task, be he master, journeyman, or apprentice. When I ride up the street of steel, I want to hear hammers ringing, night or day. So this endeavour could hardly have been kept a secret in King's Landing, yet in spite of the master armourer Solorian, one of the leaders of the so-called Antlermen, being in that meeting with Tyrion, this is the first time Davos, or any other of Stannis' men, had heard about it. With more time to contemplate the true purpose of the longest boom chain that ever was, perhaps they would have figured out the possibilities and remained one step ahead of Tyrion. However, Imri bragging about defeating a fishing fleet rather than considering the intelligence they could provide epitomizes a fatal flaw in preparation that has, 
once again left Stannis at a disadvantage. At the same time, it paints Davos as a man fully focused on the task at hand and free from the constraints of a large ego. He attempts to unravel Tyrion's scheme and consents something is amiss, but doesn't have the time nor the authority to investigate fully. He concludes that Tyrion must be planning to close off the mouth of the river and even hopes his counterpart will succeed, as it would force Imri to reevaluate his plans. Hoping that the secret schemes of your war rival come into fruition in order to tame the haste of your own admiral does not sound like a great position to find yourself in. The sea was full of sound, shouts and calls, war horns and drums, and the trill of pipes, the slap of wood on water as thousands of oars rose and fell. Keep line! Davos shouted. A gust of wind tugged at his old green cloak. A jerkin of boiled leather and a pot helm at his feet were his only armor. At sea, heavy steel was as like to cost a man his life as to save it, he believed. Sir Imri and the other highborn captains did not share his view. They glittered as they paced their decks. We heard in that quote more lines of contrast being drawn between Davos and Imri. George uses their appearance, and in this instance, their choice of armour, to outline the gulf between them, not just different strategists, but different people entirely. Staying lightly armoured for tactical reasons versus lumbering and heavy steel brings us back to Bronn's fight to the death with Sir Vardis Egan in the Vale. Davos must look a strange sight in his pot helm, but he's practical, not superficial, and he thinks for himself. It's no wonder that the pragmatic Stannis Baratheon has a soft spot for his Onion Knight. With the front lines finally completing the transition from sail to oar in order to become less vulnerable to fire, the ships of the second line were moving into position. Pride of Driftmark, Wraith and Bold Laughter, along with Harridan, Seahorse, and Lord Celtigar's Red Claw all took their places. Davos still has Allard's Lady Maria beside him to the right, or starboard, and to Allard's starboard are those three galleys seized from the unfortunate Lord Gunser Sunglass. Their names, piety, prayer, and devotion, remind us of Stannis' objection to his vassal Lord Gunser. He's noted to be a pious man every time he's mentioned, and he had renounced his support of Stannis's claim when Melisandre torched the images of the Seven on Dragonstone. While the Lord of Sweetport Sound had been summarily thrown in a dungeon, Stannis is not above making use of his archer-carrying war galleys, which find themselves on the far right wing in a wholly dangerous spot, disposable ships from a disposable lord. One vessel which didn't lower its sail was the aforementioned swordfish, which is now labouring through the waves using both oars and sail to keep up. Once again, Davos frowns at the ship, thinking, A ship of that many oars ought to be much faster. It's that ram she carries. It's too big. She has no balance. So, as we said, keep your eyes on this one. By now the wind is coming up from the south, so it's a headwind going against the fleet, but it makes little difference because most vessels are using oars and the current of the flood tide is working for them, pulling them into the bay. However, Davos notes that the Lannisters will benefit from the flow of the river current, giving them a potential advantage when they meet. It's great to experience an expert like Davos continually monitoring the environment around him. Rather ominously, he thinks... We're fools to meet them on the black water. In any encounter on the open sea, their battle lines would envelop the enemy fleet on both flanks, driving them inward to destruction. On the river, though, the numbers and weight of Sir Imry's ships would count for less. They could not dress more than 20 ships abreast, lest they risk tangling their oars and colliding with each other. So again, Davos criticizes Sir Imry's decision-making in his internal monologue. 
he would have the fleet spread out and use the width of the bay to wrap around the enemy lines. Imri's more belligerent style of speeding into the river means that their large fleet is going to be packed in like sardines and they lose most of their advantage of numbers. At this point, Davos is concerned with being efficient and playing to strengths, even without knowing the full repercussions of their ships being hemmed in so closely together. Tyrion must be rubbing his hands together as he watches the armada approaching from the walls of the city. And it's about now that Tyrion would have seen them, because from Davos' perspective, the Red Keep comes into full view, and we get this beautiful description. Beyond the line of warships, Davos could see the Red Keep up on Aegon's high hill, dark against a lemon sky, with the mouth of the rush opening out below. Across the river, the south shore was black with men and horses, stirring like angry ants as they caught sight of the approaching ships. Stannis would have kept them busy building rafts and fletching arrows, yet even so the waiting would have been a hard thing to bear. Trumpets sounded from among them, tiny and brazen, soon swallowed by the roar of a thousand shouts. Davos closed his stubby hand around the pouch that held his finger bones and mouthed a silent prayer for luck. It must have been some sight for both divisions of Stannis' forces to see each other, with the relief that, for the time being at least, everything is going according to plan. As we heard, Davos even whispers a prayer to himself, and you can rest assured it wasn't to R'hllor. We don't have a POV on Stannis, but we can imagine him furiously marshalling his troops ready to cross the river for combat. And with the Red Keep in sight, Imri's battle formation takes shape. The triple-decked 300 or Fury leads the way, flanked by Lord Stefan and Stag of the Sea, each boasting 200 oars. On the wing are a host of ships powered by 100 oars each, probably single-decked vessels. As they all line up, Davos hears an ooh. Sir Imri has sounded the attack, and there's no turning back. Davos notices Swordfish still has her sails up as he orders a fast cruise. Remember he's in the second line and so can't see ahead clearly, but is perplexed that there's no sign of the boom chain. However, knowing the waterfront better than the back of his hand, he senses something is amiss. It says, The squat towers of raw new stone that stood opposite one another at the mouth of the Blackwater might mean nothing to Sir Imri Florent, but to him it was as if two extra fingers had sprouted from his knuckles. The two stone towers alarm Davos, even more so when he sees the glistening chain. But before he can get to the bottom of why the chain has not been raised, his attention is diverted to the enemy before him. A thin line of galleys Davos knows well from his days as a smuggler. At this moment in time, there's likely no one on this nautical battlefield with more pertinent knowledge than Davos Seaworth himself. The river that had seemed so narrow from a distance now stretched wide as a sea, but the city had grown gigantic as well. Glowering down from Aegon's high hill, the Red Keep commanded the approaches. Its iron-crowned battlements, massive towers, and thick red walls gave it the aspect of a ferocious beast hunched above river and streets. The bluffs on which it crouched were steep and rocky, spotted with lichen and gnarled thorny trees. The fleet would have to pass below the castle to reach the harbor and city beyond. Davos thinks, they want us jammed close, constricted, no way to sweep around their flanks, and with that boom behind us. When he perceives that some of the crown's best ships are absent from the defence, he tastes a trap. It says, but where was the Lion Star? Where was the beautiful Lady Lyanna that King Robert had named in honour of the maid he'd loved and lost? And where was King Robert's hammer? She was the largest war galley in the royal fleet, 400 oars, the only warship the boy king owned capable of overmatching fury. By rights, she should have formed the heart of any defence. 
Davos is afraid that the more powerful ships of the royal fleet might be waiting out of sight in the bay and has already felt a small amount of relief that Salador San was guarding their rear. Readers are reminded that Tyrion had pointedly sent the five best warships of the royal fleet to accompany Marcella to Dorne and will soon begin to realize that his goal may not have been just Marcella's safety, but to preserve those valuable ships. There is indeed a trap. It's just not the one Davos is worried about. With clouds of arrows and pots of flaming pitch now raining down upon them, illustrating just why the starboard wing was the most dangerous, the battle is now well and truly underway. Fire spreads across the decks of Dragon's Bane, Queen Alisan, and Courageous, no doubt as the result of Tyrion's orders. And as Davos had anticipated, the starboard wing takes most of the damage, remembering that only Allard's Lady Maya and the trio of sunglass galleys are to the right of him on the second line. Swordfish should be somewhere in the second line too, but has fallen back to the third. And under his visorless pot helm, Davos witnesses a fire on Allard's ship, and then a scorpion shaft pierces the wood beside Mathos's feet. Davos's sons are in peril, and there's nothing he can do, and it's all because of Imri Florence's choice to position them so precariously and then ignore their father's advice. Devotion finally lands its archers on the starboard bank, remembering that the plan for the lines behind the front was to deploy any troops along the banks and then rejoin the naval assault. Prayer and piety follow suit, but Joffrey's cavalry arrived to cut the archers down. Perhaps leaving the archers unguarded wasn't a great plan, and as men-at-arms rush to defend them, the scene turns into, quote, blood-soaked chaos. It's perhaps no surprise that at the center of the storm is none other than Joffrey's own choice of Kingsguard, the fierce hound, Sander Clegane. Earlier, in the Red Keep, Cersei had confronted Tyrion over his plan to take the hound from Joffrey telling her that he needed Sandor to lead sorties to make sure Stannis' ships weren't able to land any men on their side of the river, Tyrion had insisted, leaving guarding the king in the hands of Sir Merin Trant and Osmond Kettleblack. Now, as Sandor, in his hound's helm, white cloak flapping behind him, slashes his way up the plank to prayer on his warhorse, Davos surveys the blackened desolation of the riverfront. As we discussed earlier, Tyrion had ordered Bronn to clear out the waterfront to prevent the ramshackle structures helping Stannis' efforts to scale the walls of King's Landing. When Davos sees Tyrion's block ships sitting in the shallow waters, he thinks we'll have no landing there, and so we get a taste of how effective Tyrion's defensive strategies are against Sir Imri's ill-considered and hasty approach. Davos hears the front line of Stannis' fleet finally meet the opposition and a naval scrum develops in the mouth of the Blackwater, which sees casualties on both sides. As Joffrey's trebuchets rain stones down on the melee indiscriminately, which we can take as an early sign that Tyrion is viewing his fleet and men as entirely disposable, it says, All across the river the first line was engaged, Grappling hooks were flung out, iron rams crashed through wooden hulls, borders swarmed, flights of arrows whispered through each other in the drifting smoke, and men died. But so far, none of his. Back in King's Landing, Sansa has joined Cersei in the Queen's ballroom inside Maegor's Holdfast. But one of the last things she observes before she enters the tower is that the battle has well and truly commenced. Once again, the sounds tell her a story. It says, Away off, she could hear the sounds of battle. The singing from the sept almost drowned them out, but the sounds were there if you had the ears to hear. The deep moan of war horns, the creak and thud of catapults flinging stones, the splashes and splinterings, the crackle of burning pitch, and the thrum of scorpions loosing their yard-long iron-headed shafts. And beneath it all, the cries of dying men. 
After Davos first employs his bowmen to fire upon Kingslander, successfully killing their captain, his next on-the-fly maneuver is to sweep Black Betha upriver at ramming speed. With his archers and oarsmen utilized, Davos is in full attack mode, and to his right, Allard follows suit with Lady Maria. Both ships crash into Lady Shame broadside almost simultaneously with such force that men are thrown off Lannister decks three boats away. While this sounds like an effective strategy from Davos, the scene also serves to illustrate how tightly packed the water is right now, playing into Tyrion's hands. The first line had been transformed into a confusion of separate struggles. The three tangled ships loomed ahead, turning their decks a red chaos as men hacked at each other with sword and axe. And as Davos does his best to reverse Black Betha out of the scrum, witnessing Lady Shame fall apart and its armoured men sink to the bottom of the Blackwater, he gets his first glimpse of wildfire. Evil stuff, and well-nigh unquenchable, he thinks as hungry green flames spread over Queen Alisanne. Sir Imri had anticipated the use of wildfire, yet grossly underestimated how much Tyrion has at his disposal, and it soon becomes evident how lethal even a small amount of the substance can be. The fire was spreading over Queen Alisanne and her foes faster than he would have believed possible. Men wreathed in green flame leapt into the water, shrieking like nothing human. And it's now that Davos notices the, quote, swarm of small boats bearing down river, a confusion of ferries and wherries, barges, skiffs, rowboats, and hulks that looked too rotten to float. Even the experienced Sir Davos Seaworth cannot imagine that these vessels pose any direct threat whatsoever and dismisses them as a desperate attempt to get in the way and perhaps delay further landings. In fairness, this might have been a sound strategy, given that most of Stannis' fleet is now comfortably within the range of Joffrey's trebuchets, currently sending oxen-sized boulders crashing through decks left and right, whereas the battlements of the Red Keep remained out of range of Stannis' catapults aboard Fury. This position suits Tyrion more than Imri, yet we all know that the acting hand has something far more devastating up his sleeve. The scene on the water becomes chaotic. Some of Stannis' ships have broken away to make their drop-offs and sail upriver to aid Stannis' crossing, while many remain entangled, oarless, or damaged in other ways. Davos strikes a glancing blow against the pleasure barge Queen Cersei while he receives the same treatment from the Lannister galley Whiteheart. Incidentally, Whiteheart is the ship whose master would have defected to Stannis' side were it not for Varys' intelligence delivered to Tyrion. As an example, to, quote, ensure the continued loyalty of other captains, the man was sent to Joffrey for justice, and so his ship remained on the crown side. Evading the full force of the blow, Black Betha scrapes alongside the ship, and Davos orders his men to board. Before Davos can find Whiteheart's captain, the man is slain by Black Betha's men-at-arms. Davos takes an axe to the head, but fortunately, his pothelm saves him. In response, Davos stabs his attacker through the belly with his sword before his men successfully take Whiteheart under their control. For a short moment, Davos observes the carnage around him. Ships slamming together and catching fire, troops boarding vessels, boulders crashing down, archers loosing, men disembarking to join the attack on the walls, Stannis' troops crossing the river to join them. This naval assault is reaching fever pitch, and Davos is in the eye of the storm. He thinks the whole of Stannis' fleet was in the river now, save for Salador Sans Lysini. Soon enough, they would control the Blackwater. Sir Imri will have his victory, Davos thought and Stannis will bring his host across, but gods be good the cost of this. But before Davos can collect his thoughts, something else catches his eye. It was Swordfish, her two banks of oars lifting and falling. She had never brought down her sails, and some burning pitch had caught in her rigging. 
The flames spread as Davos watched, creeping out over ropes and sails until she trailed the head of yellow flame. Her ungainly iron ram, fashioned after the likeness of the fish from which she took her name, parted the surface of the river before her. Directly ahead, drifting toward her, and swinging around to present a tempting, plump target, was one of the Lannister hulks, floating low in the water. Slow green blood was leaking out between her boards. No! 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 So Davos has been concerned with swordfish all the way through this chapter, noting her flaws no less than six times. And once again, his instincts were correct. With an inept captain, swordfish had lagged behind her line due to the critical imbalance of her ornate ram, and thus needed to keep her sails raised to compensate. Now those very sails have caught fire and will provide the perfect spark to set off the wildfire bomb, composed of highly unstable wildfire jars left over from the reign of Ares II that Tyrion had placed in those seemingly useless vessels Davos had wondered about earlier. Swordfish charges through the rotten hulk and Davos sees... Green gushing from a thousand broken jars, poison from the entrails of a dying beast, glistening, shining, spreading across the surface of the river. And if Davos felt helpless before, imagine his panic as he tries to reverse his ship out of harm's way while trying to cut the grappling lines that bind Black Betha to White Heart. His worst fears come true as he hears that ominous woof when Swordfish's sail ignites the wildfire. The ship explodes to smithereens and Davos is thrown violently from Black Betha into the burning Blackwater. Shocked, disorientated, and desperate, the Onion Knight is clinging for his life. Swordfish and the Hulk were gone. Blackened bodies were floating downstream beside him, and choking men clinging to bits of smoking wood. Fifty feet high, a swirling demon of green flame danced upon the river. It had a dozen hands, in each a whip, and whatever they touched burst into fire. He saw Black Betha burning and white heart and loyal man to either side. Piety, cat, courageous, scepter, red raven, harridan, faithful, fury, they had all gone up. King's Lander and God's grace as well, the demon was eating his own. Lord Valerian's shining pride of Driftmark was trying to turn, but the demon ran a lazy green finger across her silvery oars, and they flared up like so many tapers. For an instant, she seemed to be stroking the river with two banks of long, bright torches. As Davos is pulled away by the merciless current, grasping to a piece of driftwood, his first thought is for his sons. Unbeknownst to him, all four who fought on the Blackwater, Dale, Allard, Mathos and Marek, died in the explosion or soon after. Another wildfire-laden vessel goes up and there's chaos and devastation all around him, burning men, boiling sea and broken ships. And as he is swept out toward the bay, Davos realizes that the boom chain has finally been raised, and at last understands its purpose. The chain was forged not to keep them out of the river, but to trap them within. Tyrion Lannister had planned to create a raging green inferno, burn the fleet on the water, and then prevent a retreat. And the plan had worked. In the last line of his chapter, Davos thinks... The mouth of the Blackwater Rush had turned into the mouth of hell. Given the entire starboard wing of Stannis' fleet was destroyed, and that Sir Imri very likely considered the three sunglass ships disposable, 
we're left to wonder what Davos, Dale, Allard and Mathos were all doing bunched together beside those disposable ships. Davos' sons believed it was a place of honour, but he understood it was a place of peril. Could the truth be that this was a place of contempt? It's made plain that Sir Imri and other High Lords in Stannis' faction frown upon the low-born Onion Knight and resent him for climbing the social ladder from smuggler to knight. Could it be that High Captain Florent saw the Seaworths as just as disposable as those sunglass ships? Would he have placed a family of his high-born fellow lords in the same position? As the mouth of hell swallows four of Davos's sons, we are left to wonder. And so, with much of his fleet now ablaze, and nearly all of Joffrey's, it's seeming like less of a sure thing for Stannis Baratheon. But a number of the Mira ships and a good part of the front line had escaped the Inferno, and Stannis still had 20,000 men on the south bank of the river. If only they had a bridge. When we return for part two of this analysis, we'll cover what happens next for Stannis and Tyrion as the battle continues to rage, and we'll take a close look at the mood inside the city, specifically in the Queen's ballroom of Maegor's Holdfast. Until then, we'll leave you with the scene upon the Blackwater as Tyrion views it from the walls above the mudgate of King's Landing. Beyond the mud gate and the desolation that had once been the fish market and wharves, the river itself seemed to have taken fire. Half of Stannis' fleet was ablaze along with most of Joffrey's. The kiss of wildfire turned proud ships into funeral pyres and men into living torches. The air was full of smoke and arrows and screams. Downstream, commoners and highborn captains alike could see the hot green death swirling toward their rafts and carracks and ferries, borne on the current of the black water. The long white oars of the Mirish galleys flashed like the legs of maddened centipedes as they fought to come about, but it was no good. The centipedes had no place to run. A dozen great fires raged under the city walls where casks of burning pitch had exploded, but the wildfire reduced them to no more than candles in a burning house, their orange and scarlet pennons fluttering insignificantly against the jade holocaust. The low clouds caught the color of the burning river and roofed the sky in shades of shifting green. Eerily beautiful, a terrible beauty, like dragon fire. Thanks so much for joining us for part one of our analysis of the epic Battle of the Blackwater. We'll be back soon with part two, but now, as always, it's time for us to give credit where credit is due. Thanks to Scad from Davos Fingers Podcast for his voice acting on the Antlerman advert. Thanks to George R.R. R. Martin for all the epic battles in A Song of Ice and Fire. And thanks to Kevin McLeod for allowing us to use his music in our production. As usual, we'll end today with thanks to our patrons from the Castle Steel level. If you enjoy the podcast, consider being a patron and you could be hearing your name here too. Heartfelt thanks to AJ, Aegon the Sixth, Alex, Ali B, Ali C, Amber, Oakenfist, Arshia, Brand the Builder, Brian, Camille, Casey, Charitable Rereadings, Chris, Christian, Maddie and Jessica, Sir Clint the Andal, Sir Duncan Cole, Convenience or Death, Sir Archibald Cadogan, Dimitri B, Dennis, Esme, Liza, Emily of the Erie, Ezra, Felix, Sir Gladworth, Greg, History of Westeros, Archmaester Kobe of the Higher Mysteries, Brendan Beefish, Goldie Juke, Jim McGeehan, Winter's King, John Aris, Rider of the Ice Dragon, Sonarion, the White Storm, Julie Beth Tarth, Judson, Archmaester June, Healer of the Lesser Poxes, Katie, Lady Kelly, Mistress of the Old Bay of Crabs, Mathos of House Baratheon of Dragonstone, armed with the Valyrian sword Malice, Tree Girl, Sir Galahoo of What, Lena Snow, known as the Twilight Star, Lemba, Lemmy B, Nessie the Questing Beast, Monaro Geek TV, Maria, Margareta, and our cohort of Matts, Matt A, Matt C, Matt K, Matt L, as well as Lady Beatrix of House Grey, Maester Mary, Michael M, Anime Lover Nicole, Nimble Nick One Irick, 
Patrick, Peter Pebble, PJ, Philip, Paul B, Paul H, Richard, Sam, Sarah, Sir Daniel the Sneaky Russian, Sir Swift the Peppered Knight from the House of Black and Gray, Sherry, Cern, Terry, Sir Terence, Knight of the Cedars, Theo, the Cannibal of Casterly Rock, Hey Mahalmint, the Sellsword Sentinel, Valen Valentine, Maiden of the Black Frost, Virginie, Quarren Halfhand, and Yvonne. As always, let us know if I've pronounced any of your names wrong, if you have a nickname you'd prefer to use, or if you feel we've left anything out. Visit RadioWesteros.com for quick access to all our podcasts. You can also find a link to our Patreon campaign, donate via PayPal or Coffee, and comment on our content there. Or find us on YouTube, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you find your podcasts. And of course, you can connect with us via Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, or email. Thanks again for joining us. We'll see you soon with a new episode. Bye for now.